Yesterday, my wife and I, we returned from a trip in Canada where we spent the last four days snowboarding and skiing. Uh, I'm standing here, but my legs are super sore because we did that four days in a row. I only get to do this about once a year, so I try to take full advantage every time I get to snowboard. And so my legs are sore. If, if, I, if I fall from the stage or on the stage, you know what's happening here, so pray for me as I'm preaching that the Lord will keep me strong and uphold me. And the reason why we did that, it's not just to brush up on our skiing or snowboarding skills. The reason why we did this is because several years ago when we met with a marriage counselor, our marriage counselor told us that in order to maintain our relationship strong, you need, as a couple, one hour a day, one night a week together, one week in a month, and one week a year together. And, and we've been doing that. Obviously, it's not perfect. There are days that uh, we're really busy. There are days that I'm not at home because I'm traveling or in meetings. But we try to live up by this rule, and it has strengthened our marriage. Uh, we've learned that the greatest thing that we can do for our children is to set a solid foundation for our marriage. We learned that if we give each other our lives and our hearts, we would set the best foundation for our kids. The best thing that you can do for your kids as a parent is not put them at the best schools, although that's good, is not to uh, put them to be coached by someone like Tony in, in, in uh, after school sports programs, is uh, not to buy them the nice toys or take them on the best vacations, it's really to invest in your marriage. That's what they need. Uh, today we arrive at the last sermon, what, what we call the series finale for this God First series. And throughout this series, we've been looking at Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, specifically chapter six, where he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. We talked about what it looks like to put God first with our time, with our money, with our influence, with our fruits. And today, we're talking about God first in our house. And interestingly enough, the part of the Sermon on the Mount that we're gonna be reading from are the closing words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. If you've come to Crossbridge Key Biscayne for a number of weeks, months, or years, you know that when I preach a sermon, I always leave the best for last. I always wrap up my sermons with the grace that's offered to us constantly by Jesus of how Jesus is the foundation for everything that we must do and we must be as a people. And these are the last words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. In the last words of Jesus, the closing words of Jesus, you will learn that Jesus there gives us a picture. Jesus in this last portion of his sermon, which I believe is the best part because he summarizes everything, he gives us a picture to live for. He shares with us, in my own understanding, the dream that he has for you and I. So let's go to Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to read verses 24 through 27. We will also visit um, Psalm 127 because it aligns perfectly with what Jesus has to say here. But these are the closing words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Everyone then, when he says everyone then, he says he's the final application, right, of everything that he has taught and he said, everyone then who hears these words, all of the words that he has spoken up to this point, and does them will be like the wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, 
and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and it beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. These are the last words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And in these last words of Jesus, he shares with us, therefore, the dream that he has for us. Then secondly, the tragedy of the loss of this dream. And then lastly, the restoration of that dream. How can we restore that dream? Some of you need to hear this for the first time because you never heard about the dream that Jesus has for you, the picture that he wants your life to look like. You may not know this. Some of you are not in that place. Some of you are going through the tragedy of the loss of that dream. You've had that dream, but you're going through a tragic moment right now. And Jesus does not want to leave you there. He wants to restore your dream. Actually, the dream that he has for you. All right, so let's look at these three things today. First, well, what is the dream that he has for us? You know, the American dream is, uh, is a dream of equal opportunity uh, for people. That's offered for people. And it's ultimately summarized, as, as, as you would know, in, in owning a home and starting a family and having a stable job. That's the American dream. Most people that come to the United States, they have come with this dream. Most of us here in this room are either children of immigrants or immigrants ourselves, and that has been the dream that has got us here. Well, Jesus is talking here in the Sermon on the Mount about the kingdom, his kingdom. Uh, Here's the spiritual country that we have come to belong through faith in Jesus. And in this kingdom, there's a dream for every person that's a part of this kingdom, which is to have a solid, healthy house built on the rock. That's the dream of the kingdom is that there would be a healthy house. Now, when Jesus talks about this idea of a house here, he's not talking about a physical house. He's not adding or agreeing to the American dream. The word in Greek there is the word oikos. And every time the word oikos is used in the Bible, it can be translated as household. Uh, The oikos was your web of relationships, your household. So in the Bible, you have the house of David and the house of Saul. And that oikos, that house, involves first your primary relationships, your core relationships, which is your immediate family. Then out of that, there are your work relationships. Then there are your... Uh, relationships that you have with your neighbors. There's a whole web. Here's a chart here to show you what that looks like. See, this, this is what an oikos looks like. And so God's dream for you is that you would have a healthy oikos, that all your relationships, your friendships, your work relationships, your extended family, and your core relationships, which is your family, would be healthy, a healthy one. You know, see, we human beings were not created to live alone. In fact, when Adam was created first and Eve had not been created yet, after all things had been created, the Trinity, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, look at Adam in his condition and says something. It is not good that man is alone. We were created for relationships because we were created in the image of a God who is community. And no one can thrive unless they exist in healthy relationships. And so this dream that God has for you starts with your core relationships. God has a dream for your family, 
I want to tell you that. God has a dream for your marriage. God has a dream for your children and your relationship with them. And he hopes that that would be a healthy one, and he wants to provide you the resources so that that becomes a healthy one, so that it extends to the outer borders of your oikos, to the outer borders of your life. The hope is obviously, as Jesus says there in verse 24 and 25, is that it would be built on a rock. So that when the floods come, when the storms come, when the winds blows, because the wind always blows and the storm always comes, and if you live in Key Biscayne, there's always floods. <laughs> there are times that you're here and you see people kayaking down the street <laughs> because they always come. In this life, the storms always come. And the hope is that it would be so healthy so well built that it would resist the storms of life. Is your oikos weatherproof? You know what will test the durability and the quality of your oikos? The storms. The storms reveal what's underneath your foundations. What's underneath your foundations? And maybe the reason why some relationships in your life, some core relationships in your life have fallen apart to begin with is because you did not have solid foundations as you built that relationship upon. Sometimes a marriage does not last because it lacks those foundations, because it's built in uneven foundations, friendships the same. And the hope is that there would be a solid foundation underneath it because the storms will reveal it. I don't know if you remember a few years back, those of you who live here in Miami, there was this building in Surfside that half of it went down. And they did the investigative work of why that happened And the revelation was faulty pillars, faulty columns, faulty foundations. And as the winds came and many storms came and attacked that construction, over time, over time, they began to chip away, chip away, chip away until one day, It did not resist the conditions, the soil, the weather, and it came crumbling down and over 100 people were killed. See, this is what the tragedy that Jesus is talking about looks like in our lives. When the foundations are not laid in the right place. It's what he talks about in verse 27. If you go to verse 27, which was the last verse that we read, He says, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall for it. That that expression there, and great was the fall of it. In that culture, that expression equals, and it was a great tragedy. Jesus does not want that to be the case for your family. Jesus does not want that to be the case for your marriage. And whenever that happens, that's a tragedy. Jesus doesn't want that to be the case for your relationships with other brothers and sisters in Christ and friendships that you have. That is a tragedy when that happens. But the question and the diagnosis that Jesus is, is, is coming to is, uh, what foundation was laid underneath it? Obviously, an opposite to the foundation that we should be building our relationships, our oikos on, which is the rock, there is the sand as an alternative. And the picture that Jesus wants to uh, get us to understand here is that uh, anything that's built on a rock is reliant on God, fully reliant on God. As a matter of fact, what does he say in verse 24, the very first words? Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Anything that is reliant on God, dependent on God, is solid. And opposite of that 
anything that's reliant on ourselves or reliant on self, it can be yourself or themselves, is a shifting foundation. And I'm thinking about that because a lot of our relationships are established by our own strength and we think that the maintenance and the securing and the protection of these relationships ought to come by our own strength as well, our own self. What does it look like to build, uh, you know, a relationships or relationships on something else other than God, on rely on ourselves rather than God for our relationships? It's set ourselves as the foundation underneath them. And, and, and what this looks like on a daily basis is this. When you, when you put yourself as the foundation for any relationship, so think about your marriage, think about your parenting, you always, as, as the foundation, you know, the foundation, it's, it's where everything is built, so you, you are now the standard, and you're setting now expectations on people and pressuring them to live by them. This is my expectation of what you should be like as a spouse. These are the expectations that you should be like as children. And this is the standard. And you dare not come under this standard. You better turn out a doctor, a lawyer, or a business person. Otherwise, you are a total failure. Many of you grew up with that burden of expectations, of living up to your parents' ideals. And and many of you are doing that to your children right now. Many are doing that to your spouse. I expect you to be this and this and that, and that list goes on. Many of you are living under those heavy expectations. When you set yourself as a foundation, this, this, this foundation of sand that Jesus is talking about, there's, there's not just the matter of setting the standard expectations for others to live by, but there's a matter there of identity as well, where you're looking at those relationships as to the source, as the source by which you extract your sense of self-worth. I, I keep thinking about this, that, uh, and I, I know this is hard for many Americans to hear, but um, the family is great, but we tend to make an idol out of the family. And so many times as a pastor, you know, with the church, with uh, many young families throughout the campuses, I noticed that the, the desire of parents to have kids in specific schools has, have very little to do with the kids themselves and more to do with them. They want to show others where their kids go to school. They don't care how their kids are performing in school as long as they go to the right school. They don't care what that school is doing to their child and how that school is preparing them for the future, what foundation it's setting underneath their children. It's about them. They're proving themselves through the success of their children. That happens with sports and many other ways as well. We link the success of others as a way to build our self-esteem. Because it's not built on Jesus. These relationships are built on self. It's built on us. It's built on our self-centeredness. And therefore, we tend to become over-controlling, extremely controlling. And some of you have parents like that. Some of you have spouses like that. Extremely overprotective. which leads to extreme jealousy because you want to protect that because that's your identity. You can't lose it. You're focused on outward behavior versus then what's happening inside the heart. And, and, and most of the instruction that's given, it's on how to outwardly obey instead of trying to understand what's going inside the heart. Uh, Beth and I, we caught ourselves several years back in our parenting, realizing that what we were demanding from our kids was outer obedience 
and not sit, sitting down with them and trying to figure out what was going on in their hearts, and we realized that what we were preparing them for was a works-based religion. Let that sink in. We were not teaching them a culture of grace. We were prepping them to be future legalists and moralists who would put that same burden of expectations on others. And what Jesus is saying here, every time that you do that, every time that you replace him for any other type of foundation, there's gonna be consequences. That's what the text is saying. There's gonna be consequences. Uh, first of all, there's gonna be restlessness. Go, go to Psalm 127 now, which is uh, the parallel text that we're working through as well. I'm just gonna read verses one and two. The psalmist writes this. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. And unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. How many of you have such a tight environment that you're putting others through and, and, and you, you know, starting with your core relations, like I, I hope that you're applying this from the core to the, to the fringes. It's, it's, such a, it's, it's such a tight type of, of, of culture and environment that you can't even enjoy anything in life. You can't even enjoy the relationships because it becomes all about performance. You're so busy trying to prepare the meal that you can't even enjoy while you eat the meal. You run such a tight ship that there's no space, there's, there's no margin for fun. There's restlessness, and in fact, you go to bed at night and you can't go to sleep, and your body lays to rest, but your heart and your mind doesn't because you're thinking about your kids tomorrow. How are they going to do? What are they going to be? Or what, et cetera. How are they going to perform in school? And uh, are they, are they going to do well? And the, the exams are coming up next. And, and are they going to have good friends? And, and et cetera, and et cetera, and et cetera. And many of us are sitting down around our dinner table and we're eating the bread of anxious toil. Because we have set another foundation, other foundations other than, than Jesus. There's restlessness. And not only that, there is disappointment. Because when you do that, you're setting yourself up for major disappointment. It's like building a Jenga tower. The higher it goes, the anxiety also is, is rising because eventually it's going to fall. There's nothing holding anything together. You're setting yourself up for major disappointment. And Jesus is warning us of that. This sermon, the, the, the closing of the sermon is to, is to remind us that there is an imminent danger ahead of us. And he's trying to tell us, he's trying to warn you and I to say, hey, no one is strong enough to hold the full weight of your oikos. No one. You can't hold the full weight of your family. You can't hold the full weight of your marriage. You can't hold the full weight of your friendships. And if you try to do that, there would be restlessness and you're setting yourself up for a big failure, great tragedy. But the word here this morning <laughs> does not end without hope. It always ends with hope and Jesus is always offering us hope there is the hope of the restoration of that dream. And, and I know that in order for that dream to be restored, for us to begin to relive this dream, if we lost it along the way at some point in time, or, or to start living this dream, uh, changes need to be necessary. And we must be patient with the process as well. It's like a box of Legos. When you buy a big box of Legos, you see the whole thing set up. 
But it's not built at once. It's one little Lego at a time. And many of us need to come to a place to realize that if that dream is going to be restored, we have to be patient. It's a process. There's a trial and error. You have to go back and and redo things. But mostly, mostly the invitation for us is to really work not on the pieces that are misplaced, but actually to work on the foundation. We must replace our foundation. You must replace your foundation if you're going to have this dream restored, if you're going to live this dream out. And I was thinking about this the other day. I was prepping this sermon. I was thinking, is it possible to replace a house's foundation? If it was not built well or if if the foundations underneath it changed, if it's shifting, is it possible to salvage that property? And I'm not an engineer, but I started going online, and it's pretty interesting. And there's this thing called the total foundation replacement. But this is what this process looks like. If you are going to replace a house's foundation or a building's foundation, first, the soil around your entire house has to be excavated. It's going to start digging underneath it. Then the entire structure is jacked up. It's It's raised, and the foundation and slab floor are demolished and removed. So you raise the house, demolish the slab that's underneath it, and then finally the foundation is rebuilt, and then the home is lowered, and the soil is replaced. This is what it looks like. Here's a picture. Many of us need to go through this work of digging underneath, of raising your oikos, of destroying the foundations, of putting a new foundation and lowering the house on the right foundation. You get the picture here? What Jesus is inviting you and I to do is to rebuild our house on him. In any relationship going forward, make sure that's built on him and nothing else. You must rebuild your relationship on him. Oh, pastor, but my house is falling apart. My oikos is falling apart. My marriage, my family, my kids, it's all falling apart. There's still hope. Total Total foundation replacement. It's not easy. It's not pleasant. It doesn't happen overnight, but it's possible. It can be done. You have to put Jesus back at your oikos' foundation. And one of the most encouraging things that I get to see as pastors through the years I've seen this, that's happened here Crossbridge keep escaping many, many times. I remember the Diagostinis who are now here and they're now deacons. Uh, Magbis and Pierre. Magbis uh, and Pierre came to church because Magbis was uh, built on a solid foundation. He's a believer. Uh, Pierre wasn't. And she's been telling him, let's go to church. We've got to go back to church. We've got to go back to church. Years and years and years and years and years. And uh, finally, he said to her, right? said, if you find a church near the house, I'll come. So she said, I found a church. Now you got to come. So they, they started coming here with their son, Pierre, who's behind the screens there. He's running the, the live stream today. And uh, in one of the services, I think they, they came to faith. Uh, God started to do work in their hearts. And I, I got an email out of the blue one of these weeks uh, where Pierre said, hey, I, uh, um, I would love if you could do our wedding. And I mean, I hadn't met them, and so I met them in my office, and they were sitting there, and he said, uh, could you do our, our, our wedding? And I said, what do you mean? You guys have a son, a teenage son? And he says, yeah, but we were never married. And my son, Pierre, who was 16, 16 at the time, 15 at the time, said, Dad, now we've come to faith. You've got to do it right. You've got to marry my mom. And so we set up a date, and we were out in the lawn, just maybe her family and some of their friends, maybe a party of like 12, 
and Pierre was the best man. After 16 years, all, all he knew was the parents, but, but he knew that they hadn't committed to one another before God, and, and I had the privilege of officiating their ceremony. Their, their, their foundation was replaced. And then the day that Pierre was baptized, so was Pierre Jr. They were baptized together because they went through this total foundation replacement that many of you need and must go through so that you can sing as the hymn, on Christ the solid rock I stand and all other ground is seeking sand. So that you can say like Joshua after inhabiting the promised land, making a resolution before the people, saying, I don't know about you and who you will serve, but me and my house will serve the Lord. Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers or the gods of the Amorites and whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And it starts with you. If you are a parent, that's your responsibility. If you are a spouse, it's your responsibility. Don't wait on the other spouse. Start living like Jesus wants you to live right now in the context of your marriage. And what does that look like? What does that living look like? Jesus says, it's simple. It's hearing my words and doing my words. Hearing and doing. A lot of us do a lot of hearing. We believe, but there's no doing. You know what that's called? Nominalism. Christian nominalists. Some of you are Christian nominalists just, just by the title and the label. And, and then some people are trying to do without believing, and you're doing it on your own strength. You're laying that sand foundation underneath your family. You know what that's called? It's religion. Religion is doing without believing. And Jesus is calling you to both believe, hear his words, and do the words. Do you believe in the finished work of Christ that it was enough to set a foundation for you to build a healthy marriage, a healthy family, healthy relationships? Do you believe in that? That Jesus on the cross had his foundation crumbled so that ours could be rebuilt. On the cross, he lost his core relationship with the Father. It was taken from him so that we would be a part of the family of God, the oikos of God. And it's to the degree that you believe this that there begins to happen that work of excavation and removal and reestablishment of a new foundation. May that be the reality in your life. May that bring you rest. May that establish grace as a culture and your oikos, may that fill you with hope today. Jesus, as your foundation, that is the hope for all of us here today. Let's rebuild that. Let's pray.